I've got with me today Martin from Fleet Aces. Hey Andy, good to be here. Good. Um, a little present for you today, just to sort of make you feel at home. The idea was I've got the top of the shirt, it was just sort of to make it a little bit easier. I'm impressed. <laughs> as, as we said before, there was no way I was going to sit in the red chair. I know, and I, I thought it was because I was a Liverpool fan, but I understand it's because it's the Arsenal red, isn't Clearly, it? Clearly, yeah. I know. And Tottenham, so, yeah, so what it stimulated me to think was pickleball. Yeah. Was, as a Tottenham fan, as a fantasy player, who would, if you had a choice, any Tottenham player, past or present, would you like to play pickleball with? Oh, um, I think I'd have to go with, well, sort of present is in the past now. I'd go with Kane, of course. All right. Yeah, he's tall. He's, yeah. You know, no one's going to lob us. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's one thing, you know, and it'd be great for the assist as well. Yeah. Put oh, away as well. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Great for assist. Consistent, yeah. Um, but if I went back in time in terms of someone I really admired and a fantastic player was Hoddle. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's that's going, back in, going back a few years now. Yeah, a lot of people might not remember who I remember Clayton Hoddle. It was oh, great, yeah, wasn't of he? Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Because there are some, yeah, because there are some, some good footballers out there I think would be good at pickleball. Um, so this is all organic chat. Yeah. We'll go wherever we want to go. It's not, I've got no particular themes. I've got some ideas what I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, I mean, one was to say, right, you are chairman of Fleet Aces Pickleball. How did you find pickleball? Get into pickleball in the first place? Oh well, it goes back. It goes back a few years. It's so I think Fleet Ace was set up by a guy called Andy Colt and yep. uh, Tracy Colt, his wife, uh, and also Andre Strachan. The three of them founded Fleet Aces. I'm not exactly sure the date. It's something like 2018, that sort of time yep. frame. Um, and friends of ours, Phil and Rach O'Hara, they were yep. playing. They live in the same road as, as Tracy and Andy. Yeah. They got involved, and yeah. lo and behold, we got dragged into it just by Rach saying to my wife Sue, "Look, pickleball's great, great fun. Why don't you guys come along and try it?" And, and had you heard of it before? Never heard of it. Never heard of you it. You know, you know. I think Rach described to Sue, you know, it was a, you know, a racket sport played indoors in a badminton court. It sounded really kind of weird, stupid name, of course. Yeah. Um, and so we just went down one, you know, one New Year. It's literally something like the fourth or fifth of January, probably 2018, 19, something like that. Uh, must be 19, I guess. Um, went down, tried it, and naturally, like most people who's, you know, get into pickleball, you get hooked. Okay, it's, yeah. It's, you know, really accessible, really easy to play. Easy to play in the sense of easy to pick up, you know, as you get, you know, as you develop or whatever. It's not that easy. There's a lot more to, to bow to the game than you realise. Yeah. But when you first get into it, that's how, that, how it happened. You know, just some friends invited us onto the court. And I think from what I've... You know, talk to a lot of other people. That's how they got into the sport as well. It's friends of friends of friends. Um, and so, yeah, that was it. Early, early 19. We got oh, into it that way. Were you a racket sports person before? Many years ago in my, in my youth, I was a squash player. Right, okay. Um, I wouldn't say I was a great squash player, um, but that's what I did. Yeah. Um, but probably back in my 20s. But I've never been, I'm not a tennis player. I can pick up a tennis racket. Very, I'm very bad. You talk to Phil or to Richard Cairns and they'll tell you I'm very bad. Um, table tennis, I can pick up you know, table tennis paddle and yeah. hit some balls. Okay, no good at it. Um, so squash would be the sport, if anything. Is it? There's a lot of people say, just, how would you describe pickleball? What, what, as, you know, is it a combination? I saw the article on the Telegraph. So yeah, yeah. A bit of squat. Well, I'll get onto that. But then a bit of table tennis, a bit of mini tennis and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Had you, have you ever experienced paddle tennis? I've seen it. I've to be honest, I've resisted playing paddle yeah. because I fear the addiction from paddle as well. Okay. And I can only cope with one addiction at the time. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, pickleball it consumes, it consumes a lot of time. You know, play uh, well, probably three times a week at least. Um, and to add on to that, you know, paddle as well. Yeah. So kind of avoiding paddle, not because I don't like the idea, but it looks, it looks a lot of fun. Because you're a golfer as well, aren't I'm you? I'm a golfer as well. So you've got yeah. golf and pickleball, yeah. so that's it. Add a bit of yoga as well. Add a bit of yoga. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no time in the week for paddle. And the yoga, do you think, does it, do you think that helps you with pickleball? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. yeah. The yoga, I think... For me, the yoga helps, um, certainly helps the golf, it helps yeah. pickleball, and I'd, I'd say it probably helps any sport you want to do. In, in what sense, though, the, sort of the mental side of it, or just the actual the um, being more flexible? Or For me, it's probably more about my core strength and my flexibility. Yeah. I don't doubt it also helps on the mental side. Um, I'm very fortunate, I don't, not to my knowledge, but I don't suffer from any mental health issues. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure in the background, you know, it gives that level of calmness. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's really around my core strength. You, know, yeah. you can see 
people can probably see as they look at me. I'm a skinny runt at the best yeah. of times. Oh, I thought you might um, have been a runner originally, you see. I've run, I have run in my time, but yeah. I'm not much of a runner. No. You know, I've got the right frame and physique for running. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, yeah. Perfect frame physique. Power to rate ratio, all that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff. Um, but, but no, I, for, the yoga helps around core strength, yeah. um, the flexibility and the agility. I'm fairly fast around the core. I'm sure yeah. the yoga helps with that stuff. Um, and I'd, av- I'd advocate for anybody, but for any sport, not just for pickleball. Because I find, I thought, find pickle boys, it's really good for your mental health in the fact that yeah. when you're there, you are in the moment and you can't, there's no distractions outside. You, you're really in, because yeah. you've got to concentrate because it is a, a bit of a chess game, yeah. isn't it? There's a way of thinking about, well, I'm starting to learn more that people don't think, if you can try and start thinking three or four shots ahead, where you can go with it, yeah. you know, and, and it's really good to be in the moment. The... Um, and then how, so from there, then how did you, I suppose, it, how did you get become, end up becoming chairman of Fleet Aces? Um, the best club in this area, of course. Naturally, yeah. Naturally. Um, how did you become the chairman? Well, if you get, cast your mind back, so 2019, I guess it was when I started playing. Yeah. Played for obviously the best part of a year, you know, occasionally, uh, once, maybe twice a week, I don't know. I think, and then it was a Sunday mornings and a Tuesday evenings were the two sort of sessions, maybe Wednesday evening. Um, Went through the whole of 19, I was still working at that time, playing that intermittently. Yeah. And towards the end of 19, of course, and early in 20, then yeah. pandemic comes along. Okay. So COVID-19 strikes in uh, early 20, lockdown in, uh, through 2020 several times. Yeah, tough times. At that point, you know, we couldn't play, you know, you couldn't go indoors and play. No. Everything was, you know, locked down. Yeah. And when they started, and so all the people just went by the wayside. Um, so when they started reopening stuff yeah what you could do you could then start playing outdoors so yeah. with phil and rach sue and myself we as again as couples we could stand on the opposite side of the net okay. not interact you know we had to we couldn't touch the same paddles all that sort of stuff but we started flick playing. the ball to the other person yeah yeah, 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 so, yeah, okay. yeah sort of can't throw it at them yeah. no. so what happened we okay. started we started playing outdoors so yeah. we kept it going we played in all weathers you know snow sleet oh hail. really yeah oh yeah yeah we, oh, we could excellent. tell the addiction yeah, oh the addiction yeah, okay, yeah, yeah good no that's yeah. good that's good um and i think um i think it was rachel or rachel or phil had got wind from tracy and andy that you know work commitments and things like that meant that they weren't going to be able to pick up the running of the club after everything came out of lockdown right um, and so the four of us really sort of said, well, more for us, uh, it can't be that difficult to, you know, to run a club. You know, these are the sort of things we would do if, um, you know, if, if Tracy and Andy can't carry on running the club, then yeah. these are the sort of things that we would do to uh, change it, update it, whatever you want to. And it really started from there. Uh, I, th- I recall the following that there was a, um, and it was an AGM, a Fleet Aces AGM, uh, virtual, of course. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, on Zoom. And on Zoom, yeah. <laughs> and I must have put my hand up to say, yeah, I'm happy to. Or you just get... put your hand up for something else. <laughs> well, it's all like, it's, it's a bit of a, a sort of... wave. <laughs> Push yeah, the yeah. button. <laughs> I think people said, oh, there's someone. There's yeah, someone yeah, there, there, you're yeah. done. Yeah. You know what it's like. Yeah. A Zoom error. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so as I say, a number of us sort of said, you know, we're happy to be involved in running the club. We don't want to see the club fold. It's, you know, the sport's too great. The club's too good. How many members were there then? Oh, I think we oh, were yeah. probably in sort of the 20 to 30 sort of level. Okay, so That's a healthy number. Healthy number. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that it could have folded as ever with any club or any uh, society, things like that. It needs people who are willing to run it. Yeah. And I think, as I say, Andy, Tracy, Andre previously, they've all been put in a lot of time, a lot of effort to get the club up yeah. and running. Um, and it would have been a real shame to see it fold. We didn't want to see it fold. We, as I say, we were addicted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And where are we, where are we? My understanding now, we're at sort of about seventy or seventy five members now. Well, we are just going to be touching eighty. We're at seventy nine um, now. The last few invitations have gone out to new members to come in, so that takes us up to seventy nine. We've got one member uh, who's currently a social member who's um, got a long term sick, but wants to come back, so it takes up to eighty. Uh, the the diff- most difficult thing, to be honest, Andy, is we've got a waiting list of nearly fifty people. I was, I heard about that. That was yeah. That obviously that's a challenge. And what, what other challenges are there? Because I mean, obviously, if people watching this, they might want to set up a pickleball club. What the obvious one is where do you play? I think that's the, that is the biggest challenge. Yeah. That's the constraining factor, I think, for ourselves. And I think talking to most other you know, players and club leaders when you go yeah. to festivals and tournaments, it's that um, you know we're constrained by physical court space. Yeah. So, as you know, you know we play at local leisure centres. We yeah. play at local schools. Yeah. The, Prime slots are weekday evenings, Monday through Thursday. Yeah. Friday less so. 
Um, but the prime slots are Monday through Thursday evenings. Yeah. And we just can't get any more court space. And so any new club starting up, that's going to be one of their, one of their early issues. Um, the other issue, of course, is getting, you know, you, you need a bit of kit. It's, it's not that expensive, but nonetheless, a bit of a capital outlay yeah. to start with. You can borrow. I think most clubs themselves would be prepared to lend kit um, initially to help someone get up and running. Uh, Fleet Aces, for example, we helped uh, uh, U3A in Odium get themselves up and running. Uh, we did some taste sessions for them. We lent them our, uh, equipment to start with, and they got funding through U3A to buy their own kit. And they're now and up, and, they're up and, they're and they're running, up and running now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent. So I think the, the whole sort of pickle community is really good. They will help other clubs get up and running. Um, but say, space, you know, how do you, you've got to actually make contact with other people who want to play the sport. Yes. Um, and I think the way, the way you fleet Ace start, you know, friends of friends is the way to go. Which leads on to who, so at the moment, obviously the clubs is sort of independently run, but there is an over, overriding body that sort of oversees pickleball in the UK. That's right, yeah. Pickleball England. It is. I understand you're stepping down as chairman this year of Fleet Aces, probably, possibly. I am. Yeah, I am. And you're going to be running for the national directorship. Uh, yep, both those, it. both those are true. Both those are true. Can you explain a little bit about Pickleball England and how they, because I want to, there is this debate about who's going to run Pickleball in the UK and they're a little bit yeah. interested because that was a lovely article I was sent the other day, well, was sent to all of us about the Telegraph about yeah. Pickleball, Paddle and Tennis. Yeah. And I was just wondering where you stand with Pickleball England and, and your views of how the club is, how, well, to explain to people how it's, how it's run in the UK at the moment. Well, let's, Take, we'll take one of those the yeah. number of things in there uh, all together. Let's take one at a time. So I'm standing down as Fleet Ace chairman. That's independent of anything to do with Pickleball England. Right. Um, my philosophy there is I've been you know, involved in running the club as chair for the last three years. Yeah. And I think it's healthy for a club to bring through new blood, new ideas. Um, so I'm stepping down really for that reason, which is there's some great volunteers. Not the addiction. The no. <laughs> it's part of the therapy. You must step back. <laughs> no, maybe, well, maybe it allows me to play even more. Um, okay. But it actually allows other people to come in and yeah. actually assist the club and get the club to grow further yeah. in whichever way uh, the members and the committee cho choose to do so. Yeah. Yeah. You, you do get a little bit tired, stayed, boring if you want yeah. because you've been doing it for a while you do get a little bit stuck in in a rut and um, by refreshing the committee refreshing maybe the volunteers all of that sort of stuff i think it just brings new life into the club so that's the reason i'm stepping down not because i don't love it and i don't love the club it's just because i think it's be good it's good practice to bring in new ideas yeah okay and so if we can get that going through the club that'd be good that's um, going to happen soon isn't it that will happen in april which is when we have our next agm and then we've got some, got a lot of people who've actually very kindly put themselves forward to oh, you know step onto the committee. Um, uh, and again, I think that shows for the health of the club, to be honest. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. great. And so the national director thing. So the national director, that was... What was the motivation for that? That was independent. Uh, motivation for that, I'm stupid, I think. <laughs> By the way, if you need water, there's some water down there, so don't yeah. feel free um, to... I think, I'm, I, <laughs> I think I'm a mug at times. <laughs> I... I so say I love the sport. Yeah. There is this addiction thing going on. Yeah. Um, and I also like the idea of trying to give back to things that um, you know you have a bit of a passion about. Yeah. And I know uh, I know that Karen and the board of Pickleball England, and again everyone who helps out. They give a lot of time, a lot of personal private time. To yeah. It. And I just felt you know I know they need help. Every say club society needs people to step up and um, volunteer and help out. And I thought well I'm retired. I can do the same thing. I have a certain skill set that might be useful, might not be. We see, yeah. um, and so I decided, yeah, okay, I'll put, you know step into the unknown and uh, offer my services. And the role? Do you know what the role entails? Well, that's a good question, really. I, I suspect the role entails whatever whatever Karen and the board decide to throw at you. Okay, because um, it says national director. It says national, so I think it's a, it's national coordination. It, there's. The organisation structure is, again, as I understand it, a little bit from the outside, um, is there's regional directors. So those regional directors look to support the growth of the sport within their region. Is this in the UK or is it just England? Well, this is Pickable in England. So this pickable is England. England. There is a Pickable Scotland. Okay. Um, and so there are different national uh, governing bodies, 
let's call them de facto governing bodies yeah. uh, for England and for Scotland. I'm going to say, I actually don't know about Wales and Northern Ireland, but let's focus on those two. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, let's focus on those <laughs> two at the moment. As long as we beat um, them at rugby. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Pickleball England is looking after England. Yeah. Within that, it's broken down into regions to get the, again, grassroots growth within the regions. Even within that, there are county representatives, representatives right. as well to just help nurture the sport and grow the sport locally. And you get that, in a sense, that if you want that, that hierarchy. Um, and it's a f- quite an efficient and effective way of doing it. There are three national director to roles um, that sit on the board and help for the coordination across the piece. And then within that, also on the board, are regional director roles as well. And now, about seven are clubs roles. expected to sign up to a tour charter within Pickle England? Or, do you, or are clubs actually independent? They don't have to be part of Pickleball England? It's... It's Is there no regulation yet? Or? There's no regulation, no. no. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a voluntary uh, organisation in the sense of if Fleet Aces wanted to be completely independent of Pickleball England, they could be. You can yeah. set up your club. What you wouldn't necessarily be able to do is participate in certain events right. that are run by and coordinated by Pickleball England. Um, the the open is uh, well sorry the nationals is the most obvious one yeah uh, you have to be a registered member of pickleball England to individually in, individually not necessarily you don't have to be a member of a club no. either uh, no Oop. yeah but certainly individually you have to be a member of pickleball England yeah the open by definition is open it's open to all comes from around the world okay oh, okay yeah yeah. Scotland, the States. That's the, the Opens area. in August, isn't it? And the Nationals That's are right. in October. And the Nationals yeah. is only for English participating players, is it? English registered regist- players. players. So again, right. you can live in Wales. Or other, so you can live overseas, but as long as you're, you know, I believe it's as long as you're an English national and you're registered with Pickleball England, then you are uh, eligible to play. Right. Okay. So, so the article I read was about who should be running Pickleball in the UK. And I, I noticed there was a, there's a discussion about paddle, and uh, I think Sport England are having a, a review because I think I had, a, I had a little conversation with Karen. She says there's, there's no funding for pickleball at the moment, and she's trying to tap into Sports England or whatever and get some yeah. finance to try and help grow the sport and all of that sort of thing. And but there's a, a resistance to be involved with the LTA. Yeah. So Do you wonder what, what that is? Is it the bureaucracy or? Well, first off, um, again, this is my understanding is yeah. that. Pickleball is not yet a recognised sport by Sport England. Aside from the governing body... Recognised sport. What do you have to do to be recognised? It's like... <laughs> check, it. like dance. Is yeah. dance recognised by hey, Sport England? I don't England? know. I've mean, looked do. into that. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> not, yeah. But you, you have to be... First off, you have to be a recognised sport by Sport England right. to be able to access basically government or lottery funding. Right, okay. Once the sport, Pickleball, is recognised by Sport England, then the clubs can get access to funding from Sport England. Okay. And that Sport England basically is the government organisation that uh, gives you access to the government funds or to national lottery funding. Okay. That's s- slightly independent from the governing body bit. Right. Um, but they are meeting, oh, my understanding again is Sport England meeting in March and going to determine, well, either determine or kick, into the, you know, kick it down the pike somewhere, um, who's going to be the national governing body, which will Will be, that be taken out of Pickleball England's hands or is that... Well, ultimately, well, I mean, uh, Port England, a government sort of backed yeah. organisation. Yeah. So they have the power to go, right, actually, we're going to take you over. Not Sport England, no. They, um, they could recognise Pickleball England as being the sports governing body or they could recognise the LTA as the sports governing body. Those two organisations, LTA, PBE, have both applied to be the sports governing body. Right. Okay. And in a sense, it is a, you could say it's a contest between those two organisations. You know, clearly one is much more fit for purpose than the other one. Yeah. Um, you know, Pickleball England has been involved for years now, growing sport, nurturing sport, bringing it through. I think all Pickleball players, by and large, would recognise Pickleball England as being the de facto national governing body, yeah. irrespective of what um, Sport England or anyone else wants to say. Um, I looked and at there some is, numbers. There is, a real, there is a real element also of voting with your feet. Um, you know, members can turn around and say, Sport England could do what they want, um, but we recognise Pickleball England as being our governing body and they can award it to the LTA and we could just ignore it and say we want to be organised by PBE. Right. Um, but that's, one, that's one side. If LTA were awarded, there'd be a... I'm, I'm clearly I'm biased, but it seems like it would be a bizarre decision to award the governing, governing body ship to the Lawn Tennis Association. 
you know, the clues in the title, they're the Lawn Tennis Association. Their first interest is in tennis. It's not in pickable. To be honest, it's not really even in paddle. Or but are they a governing body of paddle now? They are, they yes. Are. They've effectively taken over paddle. And I think everything I've read and heard is they haven't really excelled at being the governing body of paddle either. It hasn't really grown um, significantly since they've no. been doing it for the last five years. Yeah, because there's some numbers in that article. It said that tennis has 5.6 million sort of players and paddle has 175,000 and pickleball's only got 12. But I believe pickleball by next year will have doubled, you know, to 25,000. Yeah. And I know in the U in America, it's the fastest growing sport. There's 9 million people who play pickleball in, in the States. Oh, I think that's an underestimate. You read right. uh, the, the well, range, yeah. range from 9 million up to 30 million. Okay, um, yeah. You know, I'm not sure which number. And they've got some big stars that play there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is an element of having that um, sort of celebrity endorsement is a, is a yeah. big win there. And that will again pull through um, the sport into more the mainstream. But yeah, we haven't if got you, any celebrities involved yet. Have we have, have, have any notes yet? Uh, not well, of any note yet. not here in the UK. I know people like Andre Agassi and people like that and Steffi Graf. Yeah, yeah. People and might recognise. Yeah, the basketball players, the yeah. NFL, NFL players are buying up franchises. Yeah, the time. yeah, yeah. Um, but again, the, if you go back to the LTA's application, again, it's their, my understanding of their application is they see pickleball as being a feeder sport for children to come into pickleball and seeing that then as a feeder into tennis Yeah, when they become young adults. Yeah. And then at the other end of the age spectrum, um, when you get to tennis and tennis becomes more challenging because of age and whatever other reason, yeah. oh, well, then pickleball, you, you feed a sport out. Well, hang on. Actually, pickleball is a sport for all ages. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, you, you know, you're a youth, a middle age. Yeah. It is accessible to everybody. And that's really the beauty of the sport. I agree. And if the LTA just see it as being one end of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum, that seems a very perverse and bizarre way of looking at the, the, what is a sport in its own right. Yeah, I think our demographic at the moment is probably a bit at the higher end, which is, it, it, yeah. which is, which is great for us. But it, uh, trying to, I mean, part of doing the podcast was I wanted to get some of the youngsters that we know of, yeah. you know, the, sort of the Laurens and the Nears, to come yeah. and have a chat, how they get involved yeah. and how they can pass them. I mean, we met Mikey today and Mikey played, we played at Christmas with, the O'Hara's had a bit of fun and Mikey really yeah. loved it and Charlie wasn't he enjoyed it but you know he, he, he's more into football and, but Mikey thought it was great and it's like how do we encourage you know he's a 20 year old plus but the also I know we've got Sharon at our club who's trying to get the, the kids it's down at her school and yeah. after school yeah. and it's very much if it's not for her energy or people's energy for pushing that yeah. those kids aren't going to be involved but it's so accessible that you only need a badminton court and it, most schools yeah. have a sports hall yeah. and you can just set it up and play and I can imagine you know a paddle you know just hand-eye coordination starting tennis young it's a longer it's a longer racket yeah, and there's a lot more te more well, technical you think most kids um they'll go down to the beach they'll be paddling in the water you'll be playing beach bat and ball yeah yeah and that's really where you, th you think that's where I started that's, that's where, where I, I started, started yeah. Really started, yeah. yeah. like playing with your mates yeah. isn't it? when I was a kid my mum and dad yeah. playing beach bat and ball yeah. and then you know, my kids were, were young we we're doing exactly the same thing um, and it isn't vastly different, really. In Not terms really, of, no. And then you obviously put a structure around it, yeah. which is the badminton court and the net and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and do you favour in pickleball? Do you favour doubles or singles? I think oh. my, my stats show I favour doubles. <laughs> and, and singles, because I find when the doubles, I love the doubles, but the singles seems to me is a complete transition away from doubles, the way doubles uh, is played. It seems like you are playing mini tennis when you play singles. I agree with that, yeah. yeah. If you actually... Again, I'm not uh, uh, up on all the statistics, but my sus strong suspic suspicion would be if you looked at the singles performances and who are the strongest singles players, they probably come from a tennis background. Do you think that maybe the rules for singles may need to be adapted to make it more competitive, more accessible? Because just maybe encourage more people to play singles because then you, I don't know. I, it's I don't know. I'm, I think there's a place for, there's certainly a place for both singles and doubles in, in the sport. I mean, personally, I really enjoy the double side of it. Yeah. It's, it le feeds into the sort of the social side of it. Yeah. At the end of that, it's a small court and there's four people on it. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. can have a good laugh and a good banter when you're playing rec play. Um, you can wind each other up as your partners. You can wind up the opposition. You can have a laugh. Um, when you get to singles, inherently it becomes much more sort of, in a sense, gladiatorial. It yes. is much more, you know, a personal thing, me against the, that, you know, that individual on the other side of the net. Whereas it's doubles, it has that nice sort of social feel to it, which I, I really enjoy. 
Yes. Don't get me wrong. You know, you know me on the court. I'm also very competitive. Uh, yeah, we yeah. all are. Yeah. But I think there's there's been competitive in a sort of a social environment yeah. and not letting it get to you. And then when you go and compete in a tournament, and then yeah, there's, there's no rules then, isn't it? Yeah. It's about yeah. winning, isn't it? Yeah. Have you had any funny moments so through your journey so far? I mean, none, anything, none at all. No. None at all. No. <laughs> no, no. Anything that you recall that you can share? No. Oh, funny moments. Yeah. Oh, now you're getting me. No, I, not... I thought I'd just throw that in <laughs> to see if there's anything that sort of came to you, you know. But um, I think I've had. I probably had lots of funny moments. Probably mostly at my, my own expense. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe that's why I can't remember them. Maybe I bl blocked them out. You know, it's one of those sort of. Um, if you were to get someone starting, so I've got some yeah. equipment here. So these sort of paddles, there's, there's two sort of types here. And, and, and luckily for me, Diadem are giving us a lot of support. Yeah. Do you know much about the difference between them? So what, what, what inherently, the, what's so I'm, special about that one and compared to, to this one? I mean, you really they're thinner it. and fatter. Do you have a preference when, you, when you're playing sort of thick? These, yeah, these days, um, again, I'm not an aficionado in paddles, okay? Right. Um, I don't change my paddle anywhere near as much as other people who, <laughs> who may have know. half a dozen. <laughs> we know you're always selling them off, aren't they? We're always selling month. them off. Yeah. Um, there are some people who have this. You should be nameless, Chris, don't <laughs> Two or three of the same paddles in the bag. Yeah. You're, you're, and again, you, Dan. And you, Dan. <laughs> yeah. um, crudely speaking, if you take that, yeah. take that one there, yeah. that's, this is a paddle that I would probably prefer. Um, I sometimes describe it a bit more like a chopping board. It's yeah, like yeah. playing pickleball with a chopping board. These ones, generally speaking, will have more power in them. That's what I thought. And again, the thinner ones are for power, aren't they? Yeah. And if you look at my, my stature and my frame, this one is quite, you know, it's slim. thick. It's, it's slim. slim. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's slim. It's your character. It's, it's felt it? like, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, fit, it fits very much with my, my character, my personality. But it also for me, because I am such like, it helps me put more power on the ball. Right. Okay. Normally the trade-off with power then is control. Yeah. Um, and so if you take this one, this one's going to yeah, have I a little that. bit more like one. Um, control, probably yeah. a little bit less power, a bit more spin on it. Um, but I think that's probably true at the more advanced end of the game. Right. Yeah. And if you're just starting out, it makes the blind bit no difference whatsoever if you're just a beginner coming in you know the entry level paddles for a beginner you can buy a pack of wooden paddles yeah and that's the way to start start cheap get involved get hooked get um, just get your beach paddle back yeah and try with yeah. that yeah um, because it's all about learning the sort of the nuances isn't it of the oh, that one just sort of there that's, okay. i'll put these back for diadem yeah and now i don't know if you've seen these but diadem sent them to me the other day they've just come up with their own range of uh, of, of of trainer and uh, don't know how, I know my wife loves these, but they're not the right size. Is, but is that to do with the colour by any chance? I think so. I think it's called teal. I think, I think that's nice. the colour. Yeah. And then the gents yep. ones. But um, yeah, have you got a particular, because obviously we always play indoors and we've got different surfaces. I mean, again, I think footwear is important and I've gone through a couple of different brands and then you need a court shoe, but some people, yeah. I don't know if you've got any views on types I, of shoes. I, I started with a pair of Adidas um, or Adidas and they're okay, but they, I found them quite slippy after a while. And now I wear a pair of Babalats. And I, well, they're, they're, sort of tenor, they're a tennis they're, shoe. They're a court, well, they're they're a court, court shoe. shoe. Yeah, right. but they're, they're a court shoe. And that's what I would, personally I would recommend. If you're playing indoors on indoor surface, I'd go with a court shoe rather than a, 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 more of a tennis shoe just because of um, the, the motion of your foot. And for me, it gives me much more mobility around the court. Yeah. That's what I find. Um, mind you, I am in the market for a new pair of shoes because my Babalats are wearing out because they get so hear, much use. Did you hear that, Harvey? <laughs> <laughs> what size are you? Because I think these are size nine. <laughs> yeah. You can try them out well, later. What's your commission rate, Andy? Uh, I'm not on commission. I'm here to support them. They're supporting us. So we're going to just go see where it goes. But yeah. uh, no, it's very kind of Iodem to get involved. Yeah, yeah. Harvey's um, a good, good guy. No, he's a very good guy, the whole team. Um, and I take it you've been to a few of the festivals and tournaments that have been running through the years. You've been to the Nationals. Been to the Nationals, yeah. How have you done? Not as well as I would have liked. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, going, when I, I went, first went to, the first big one I went to was the Openers back in Southampton. So it's probably two years ago now. And that was a real eye-opener. Is that where the first Open was held? It wasn't where the first one. I think the first one predates that. It was up in... Nottingham. I'm sure other people come out and say, no, no, there's one even before that. But I think it went Nottingham, Southampton, and then Telford. That sort of thing. And obviously, they've been growing every, every year. Um, I would like to think I could do better, but I personally, I actually quite like to challenge myself. So I, yeah. the last couple of events, I've been going in at 4.0 level. I'm nudging at 4.0, but I'm not there. So I'm always, no, I'm sort of 
kind of trying to punch above my weight. Yeah, yeah. And that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. But what do you think the difference is, though, from... So when I was looking at football and I used to coach kids and stuff, and I was thinking, what's the difference between being, you know, a professional and that? And you know, often I felt that there are kids that have got all the skill and ability, but they just don't have um, the fitness. It was always one of my little bugbears was if you were fit and you can run around forever and you've got the talent, that then you, you yeah. can compete. And maybe also the desire. But uh, in pickleball, do you think like threes, three and a half, fours, is there much difference in that range than when you go from four to four and a half to five? Oh, I think there's a huge difference from going from four, and a, four to four and a half and four and a half to five. Um, I, what can you put it down to, though? Is it is it is it, well, is it is it is it is it something people can get to, or is it do you have to have that talent given? How, you know, th talent's always going to help. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. I think talent's always going to help, but I think the overlay on that, and I think you alluded to it a little bit with with football analogy, is there's the dedication. Yeah. I don't think if you look at any of the top players that they will get to where they are without the drilling, the practice, yeah. the repetition, the whole muscle memory, um, such that when they get on court, they don't even have to think about that shot. Yeah. They can then start focusing on the strategy and the tactics. So I th you have to work at the game. If you're going to get to that level in any professional sport, pickleball or football or tennis, whatever it might be, you can't just do it by saying, well, I'm going to turn up, have a couple of games of rec play uh, during mm. the week, and then I'll turn up on the, on the, on the court the weekend and you know, beat everyone off. Because the other people aren't going to be doing that. No. They're going to be drilling, practicing. They'll ha uh, it'll go beyond that. They'll be into the way they hydrate, what they eat. It will be, it becomes... You know, Nutrition, yeah. Everything, everything. Which then, sort of, so therefore, as a sort of a bit of a, a, a club level... Yeah. Is what are you providing for the members now? Is like if you you could have always going to have that difficult, aren't you? When you start off something small with it's just a yep. social club, yep. then you'll get a few people come in and get really competitive and go, "Oh, I need more of a challenge." Yeah. And then how do you balance all of that? Because because it's all independent at the moment, and, and I suppose there's no uh, there are no professional clubs yet. I don't think I, in America are there franchises. You do say that so yeah. you're part of yeah, yeah. I don't know Kansas City whatever yeah, they call themselves exactly and, right, yeah. and it's a professional sport it's a professional sport yeah. do you think we can get there um, I think we will in time I don't think we're quite there yet uh, no. I think we're some way away from it but it's, it is getting there you can see the movements in that direction there is a professional league though isn't there yeah there is uh, again the name escapes me right this minute so I, so I can't actually, can't plug them no. there is a, a professional league there, of course there is prize money for the nationals and the open and events like that uh, and there is a professional league um, whether they are again I guess technically the players in that are professionals they are being yeah. paid to win and they're dedicating you know, a lot of their time and lives to, to the sport but I think all, all of those most of those players are then having to get sponsorship they're either coaching as well they have to augment their income they can't win enough the purses aren't big enough um, to give them a give them a can you can you ever see a play you know we've got some local tennis clubs can you ever see a time where you've got Fleet Aces has its own own home Oh, I'd, I'd love to. I'd, hey, I'd love to see that. Um, I think there will be some uh, entrepreneurs will come along and will build dedicated, just in the way they're doing in Telford. The Telford um, Pickleball Club has done it. Is that they're, what they, they're doing up there, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've, they've done Is that it. with the International Centre where no, they... No, no, no. no um, uh, again, forgive me, I can't remember the, the, uh, the guy's name who's running it, but post last year's Telford Open, and I think they bought up some of the uh, courts. Yeah. Um, they got their own uh, let's call it a warehouse but they've fitted out the warehouse they've laid the courts there they are pickable courts no other markings no other lines and they've now got a business up and running very successfully by all accounts all right uh, making a uh, i think a small profit they're looking to add on um additional you know uh, i think a viewing gallery and um probably sort of refreshment sections they're also running various um courses for other entrepreneurs who are willing to set up similar businesses they're now marketing that and so you can go along and understand how, you know the business model what you have to get right pitfalls to avoid which is a great idea got to get some th traffic through there though, isn't it? is it open to, it's obviously open to anyone to go and it is, play yeah. so it's, it's a, you know, just like booking a badminton court yeah. you can just go and play pickleball exactly but it's that. dedicated yeah, yeah. purely just to pickleball just to pickle and clearly to make you know to make money at that thing to make it work make it viable you've got to get volume yeah and so I, what I would guess is, you know, even in our area, there will be some uh, entrepreneurs. I'm aware of a few who are looking for um, space. It has to obviously be pretty big f uh, footprint. It has yeah. to have good high ceilings. You know, disused warehouses is a good opportunity yeah. there. Um, 
quite a certain amount of capital investment into it. And then I suspect what you'll end up with is a couple of clubs would use it as their home venue. You know, if I was doing it, that's probably what I'd look to do. And then you obviously want to, you know, um, encourage anyone else to come in and get the volume through during the daytime to See, utilize that, just, that space. It just sounds, again, it's a similar thing of, of like through grassroots football. It was always the same thing. Every, I mean, even around our area, there were four, four or five youth football clubs and everyone was fighting for somewhere to train yeah. and play. Yeah. And it's like, you, I always had a, hopefully that one day all of that could come together and we could all just, because it's all about, for me, it's all about the kids anyway. And that we could all come together and maybe have a centre where you could all just go and play, train and practice. Because they do it on the continent. Yeah. They, they have it all there. And we seem to always be on the back foot and never seem to be taking the lead here where there's an opportunity. Yeah, well, this kind of takes the conversation a little bit in full circle. So... I, I think it, it, it will happen. I think we're on the cusp. Uh, I say I think entrepreneurs are coming through. There is this supply and demand imbalance. There's more demand for court space than there is supply. Yeah, that lends itself to somebody setting up, um, you know, a dedicated facility where you know it can meet that demand. And it will happen. It's happening in Telford. I'm sure it's going to happen in around this area in the next uh, six, twelve, twenty-four months. So that's one piece. That's the sort of the uh, the entrepreneurial side of it. People coming in and putting the money in there. Yeah, It'll happen. Yeah. Um, the other side goes back to, I guess, the Sport England piece, which yeah. is then being able to, pickleball being a recognised sport, yeah. being able to access funds to then lay down the infrastructure required to have a dedicated centre. And that, that's got to be a sort of a no-brainer. I, I sometimes think politicians can look ahead and, I mean, you know, I get kids off social media and or off their phones, you know, get them out and play and because you know, it will just keep them in that moment and just... It might be a star in the making already, if, you know, even five, uh, six, seven years old. and Completely. You know, I think you know, my understanding, again, is, you know, Sport England is set up there to try and get um, the nation fitter, healthier, engaged in sport for all the good reasons that we know, you know, be it the physical side, the mental side, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and if you've got this sport like pickle that's growing, growing rapidly, then why wouldn't you recognise it and start investing in it? And that and investing it across all ages, not just the young, not just the old, but all ages. Yeah, um, it is as you say. It's a no-brainer. And it's and an accessible if, if sport for e everyone, even is. disadvantaged people, even dis yeah. disabled people can play. I, I saw a gentleman in his wheelchair down at Southampton playing with able-bodied yeah. people, yeah. and it was great to it's see. Fantastic. It yeah. was really great yeah. to see. And okay, the rules are slightly different, but it's I don't know. There just seems to be no boundaries with the game. There are no boundaries. There yeah. are no boundaries and, with it, and it is so easy to set up you know it's a relatively cheap sport to set up you know so you can drop, drop a badminton net to half height yeah get a paddle get a ball and you're off and you're running exactly. yeah that really really is is cheap to get going and it's so you know it's such an it's not really hard um as an entry level sport on the on the body yeah i totally and, agree it's not hard yeah. physically and you're not running yeah. around yeah. all the time even though you are running yeah. i mean our sessions i do what two hours yeah and you do feel a bit worn yeah, out at the end yeah. but maybe that's more mental than necessarily yeah. physical all the time isn't it but there was a very also very clear progression from being an, an entry-level player a beginner player you yeah. know you can really develop yourself in the sport and get up to you know your 4.5s your 50 players people can compete at the national level um and those people will be the ones in their late teens early 20s in time to come they're already there really that's the and um, that's the thing as well I, because I, I was wondering, that where do they get their challenge? Because if we're all independent clubs and within our clubs, you're going to have a mixture, aren't you? You've got boys, girls, men, whatever, different levels, twos, two and a half, threes, yeah. three and a half. Then you, 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 that, I don't know, it's one of the challenges of our club is, like, and I think it just seems to be in sport in general, when you've got advanced players, you don't want to bring people down to the norm or the average and bring the sort of lower average up to the average because everyone needs to be challenged in their own levels and keep pushing at the boundaries. And how do you do that yeah. and keep everyone's interest because the club is only as good as its members and if you lose yeah. players. Yeah. It's a challenge that all clubs face. You know, Fleet yeah. Aces face it, but I also know from talking to, you know, other um, club leaders, every club is facing that uh, that challenge, which is, you know, we certainly are an all-inclusive club. We want to include everybody from all abilities, um, all race, all genders. You know, we want to cover the whole spectrum. But then when you get on court... People who are um, just starting or been playing a while and they want to develop further, they want to play the best players. Mm. Um, the best players want to develop themselves as well. Yeah. And they will find that by playing against better players than themselves. And so there is that sort of thing. There's the natural want. 
for many people anyway, they will want to improve that way. Other players want to be, don't care about that. I actually, I just enjoy rec play. Yeah, yeah. I just want to turn up, have a good time, whatever. And you have to try and balance all that. So inclusivity is about including all of those standards, yeah. and recognizing all those standards. They will have slightly different wants and needs and desires. And that is a real challenge. Um, and we, well, you, you know this pr pretty well, that you know we try to handle that by having multiple sessions in a week yeah. designed in slightly different ways. So yes, we have an advanced session to try and cater for the needs of the more advanced players who are, generally speaking, pretty competitive and they want to develop and play at external events and uh, competitions. Yeah. Um, then we have just rec, rec play sessions with predefined playlists. Yeah. We have rec play sessions yeah. where you just turn up and you muck in and you, you play against anybody. Yeah. Um, we will then do drilling sessions as well, which will again will hopefully improve everyone's skill level. And we do that certainly at the advanced session. We do that at sort of intermediate level. So we try and make sure our sessions cover the gamut of what you know um, people want. But it's not easy, you know. Say so no. go back to court availability. Yeah. You know, we're running five, six sessions a week now. Yeah, yeah. And we have to do that to cover all the you know what everyone wants. I, I, I think you're doing a fantastic job and you're getting that balance right. And I think the wonderful. Your lovely polls on Spawn to see you know what people's feelings are and you're trying to trying to you're never going to satisfy everybody. You, no. you never do that in life anyway. No. The there's this I don't know what your feelings are on Dupra. That, can, can I come to, to one last thing about yeah. the whole thing? Is there's another bit of the glue that holds all that stuff together, uh, which is then outside the sport, which is the social side. Yes. So say we've got 80, 80 members and we go through all these sessions, we do all these different things. But actually, the other thing we you know, I certainly feel we do well as a club is we have a social side outside of the club. So, you know, you know, we do, you know, we do curry nights. Yeah, we yeah, do Christmas definitely. Dinners, yeah, yeah. Um, we do quiz nights. Yeah. You know, there is a real social buzz from the club members when they're playing, but also they want to get together outside. Yeah. And when we run stuff, you know, we get 40 to 50 people turn up to that. And that's an, over half the club will turn up to our social events. That's pretty damn good. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, and that bit is part of the glue of the Pickleball, our Pickleball Club. And I also think that's also part of the glue of the Pickleball community as well. And uh, anybody who wants to set up a club, don't overlook that but, side of it. But wouldn't yeah. that be lovely to and you have your own sort of clubhouse and you have an oh, evening yeah. where yeah, it's yeah. like, Tuesday night is, but you can have your advanced, your intermediates, your beginners, all playing on the, yeah. on the courts. Yeah. And then coming off and going to the bar and having a, a drink and a chat. Oh, I know. I mean, I completely that'd be the agree. dream. That'd be lovely. That would be, know, lovely, that would be a dream. We know we've had some lovely friendly matches against um, against the Bourne down in Farnham. The Bangers. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Bourne, Bourne Bangers. bangers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The Bourne Bangers. Um, and, you know, the Bush has been really kind hosting us at their, their venue. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it starts as a tennis club, but, you know, there's badminton courts there and we've, you know, you play pickleball on them. But it's great to be able to play a match against them and then go up to their bar afterwards it, and yeah. have the social side. Yeah. Um, and that is the thing that, say, if we can get dedicated pickable facilities with that sort of you know, the bar, the restaurants, whatever it might be, that's fantastic. Because I mean, well, we must be playing in what five or six different locations, and and they're yeah. geographically all in, yeah. not quite yeah. close to each other all the time. And trying to get sort of say, oh, I know we sort of that end of the month, you get the sort of like end of the month, let's all go for a drink, but then not everyone's playing on a club night and then some yep. people just get out yep. of the house at seven o'clock or 10 o'clock yeah. at night to go for a drink is quite difficult. But it to pop into a clubhouse, say at seven, to watch yeah, yeah. some would be great, you know. Well, that's just so much in the fact we have to, you know, we have to go and find five or six different venues to play. Just, yeah. you know, the lack of um, lack of availability. We would love to have just one location where we go. That's our home home venue, but we don't. We have to go and source schools. But that's going to only be the success of those clubs is by the individuals that are helped doing that yeah. with a body that's running it with finance yeah. and funding. Again, that needs to be managed really carefully if it, when yeah. it does come into the game. How do you distribute those funds? What is it? What are you distributing for what? Yeah. You know, is it for kit? Because I mean, yeah. we don't need a lot of kit, do we? Individually, no. No. I mean, a pair of trainers you can yeah. play, but paddles can be expensive, yeah. but they last quite a while. But yeah. I think that's a really careful one. I saw a poll, there was a, there's a, Petition going out at the moment, so about supporting people. But just moving back, so from a, to the different levels, now there's a thing called Dupra, and I understand yeah. that I think Andre Agassi and, and some of his friends have bought Dupra. Uh, I think they've actually bought it, and I saw a clip of him saying he thinks Dupra is a wonderful thing because it. Well, if, he, any, if he's bought it, he would say that, wouldn't he? Yeah, but on the basis from if you, whoever you are, wherever you go, I'm, probably in America, it's probably easier because you've got nine, ten, or whatever million people playing. If you go somewhere to play, 
and you walk into a court, a club or a, a pitch and you say, oh, do you want to play pickleball? And you go, what's your duper rating? You go, three and a half, you'll do for me. Because yeah. you know, he says, you know you're going to get the right sort of balance of play. Yeah. I don't, yeah. But I think here, getting a duper rating is quite tricky. Or how how level how accurate is it at the moment in the UK? I don't think. First of all, it's not particularly tricky to get. It's it's free to register. Um, I'm not I'm not selling duper whatsoever, uh, but it's very easy to get. You just sign up, um, and there you are. You're on the system, and then somebody who has no duper rating comes along and plays you and me who have duper ratings, and by playing more games, their their rating will start to evolve. Right. Um, be it a doubles rating or singles rating. It's actually really really quite simple. Um, as to whether the whether as to whether it's accurate is another matter. Yeah. Um, it's like a lot of these things. And the more the more games you play that are then rated games, the more accurate it's going to be. What ignoring you know all the discussions that you can have around the algorithm itself and whether the algorithm is good, bad, or indifferent. Just by definition, you know, statistics will tell you: if you play more and more games, it will become more refined. So long as you're making sure you're playing against lots of different players. Who's responsible though? Because I know, shout out to Christo, who's very great mm -hmm. at our club, who, who, took, who made the effort and lit, registered yeah. everybody at Dupa yeah. and started recording well, their results and started, to, well, that's how I got my rating. I used to yeah. sign up and then yeah. started doing it. But not every tournament or festival you go to is Dupa's registered or yeah. you, you're, so your results, I don't know if you could so, take away from those games the people you play and go, can I ask yeah, you a Dupa you rating so, and say before you so play? Good. Let's go back to the way we, we've done it at Fleet Taste. So we took, uh, as a committee, we took a view, which is we wanted to, we were having issues with, you know, how do you seed players? So if you're going to do some sort of seeded play, how do you do that? Rather than just doing it subjectively and being sort of judgmental on, oh, that person's better than that person. So we took a view, which is we were going to run some competitive play sessions, which we do. On yep. Monday night, there's every, roughly speaking, every other week, we run a competitive play session. Yeah. And we call it a duper rated session. And we say, if you want to play in that, you have to be registered with Dupa. And then all the scores in that session will get entered into Dupa. Right. Okay, so that's all a little bit incestuous because it's all within the club. Yeah, so but you, it, yeah, you but get to know each other's game a little bit. Of course you do, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's prob there are problems yeah, Martin's with backhand, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You spotted that. Um, <laughs> oh, that's what everyone tells me. Everybody's <laughs> backhand. Yeah. Everybody's everyone's backhand, everyone's backhand yeah. 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 Um, but it, at least it means that by doing that, we, within the club, we can then see, you know, relative ranking that helps us with our internal seedings now there, then there's and that that i think has worked really well the more people have played the better the, the, the rankings have been more refined they yeah. become and hence we can get uh, even more competitive play on monday evenings um then there's a whole bunch of us that are going to go and play in external events that help them validate those internal seedings because when you play in the open uh, and the nationals in time you get found well, out. Yeah. Well, no, not in, found out. What I meant in time, those results uh, will go into Duper. It's okay. not. It's not on Pickleball England's issue. It's Duper have been historically very slow in processing that information, right? And then refine, you know, hence them going into your own personal score. But once you get those external um, validation of our internal scores, it feeds back to everybody. So if I go out and get play against a four point five player and get absolutely stuffed, that validates or invalidates my own rating, which yeah, then yeah, will knock back onto yours if yes. you've been playing against me. Yes. And so the more of us that go out and play against other uh, other clubs, other tournaments, the better our own internal um, relative ratings work. So just finish that off, and so that's the nationals in the yeah. open. Um, a team of us went up and played at Cambridge uh, last weekend. And they again. What was that? Was that a tournament? It was a tournament. So the Cambridge Pickleball Club they run a team uh, tournament. It's called the Stour, Stir Cup. Um, I think after Pete Stir, who was a founding member of um, Cambridge Pickleball, he passed away. I'm not to be honest. I'm not so sh sure how long ago. But right. they they named the cup after um, uh, Pete Stir. Nice touch. And it was a really nice touch. We run a fantastic festival. But all of the games there are go were to be duper registered and okay. it's super. So that's okay. an external validation point for us as a club. Um, because you guys will get yours yeah. up and then when we yeah. play you, yeah. we can either drag you back or we can either drag you back down. Cascade, you know, back into the club. Do you think there'll ever be a time though, maybe like golf, yeah. for example, yeah, you, yeah. everyone has a handicap, but yeah. when you, I haven't got a handicap, but I'm probably yeah. playing around 2022. Yeah. I don't know what your handicap yeah. is in golf, but when you play, you give me shots. Yeah. So that there's a balance at the end of it. it you concentrate your game, but at the end of it, hopefully, 
the, the scores or whatever there's a balance do you think there'll ever be a time like I don't know we say I take it Chris for example maybe it's a 4.3 and there's a three yeah. and a half and you say right you start with a you start at plus a two, two, two zero. Uh, I I could see I could see that happening in. Would it be good? Would it be a good thing or not? Well, I could see it happening. It's a, it's a way of doing it, but it's I'm not exactly sure how. Again, you work out the algorithm. So, okay, so you're a four point three player, and a three point five player. That equ that equates into you know one shot, two shot, three shot head start, um, and how that works with a doubles match. When it's a for golf, when it's an individual player, yeah, and in a sense you're being handicapped against the course. Effectively, it becomes. Maybe it's slightly easier, or equally, maybe it's just because I'm more familiar with it. I'm but just wondering whether at club level, I mean, because I know the challenges that we've had, yeah. and you get people saying, oh, I never get a chance to play against somebody yeah. that much better, and they just want to see where they, their balance is. And maybe, and then you also, like you say, you get the sort of higher level player doesn't want to play because they don't, they don't want to destroy that person because they are much better than them. But if you were to pair, pair up a couple and say, right, yeah. you've got a five shot head start and it's first to 11, yeah. The focus on the the better player as well, the concentration there. I've got to draw that back, and then the other guy might try and lift again. Might be quite an interesting just concept yeah. to try. I guess to be honest, I'm going to guess that Duper really has the data to be able to do it if they wanted to. Right. Because again, my simplistic understanding of the Duper algorithm, it does say, okay, so one pair is playing against another pair. There is an expected outcome of that based on their Duper ratings. Right. And depending on the score that you result, you know, you end up with in that game, they will adjust your your own individual dupe rating and that so if it's if the if they reckon that pair a will win 11 7 or should win 11 7 based on dupe ratings and it turns out you know you win 11 5 that will be reflected so that means they have an idea of those ratings should should suggest against the other pairing you should get seven points that implies and again more, got, and if you've got more than seven points you get then a, you're, you get you're, a bump you, you get, get a bump on your yeah, rating yeah. rather than even though you lost the match you get a you, you get a yeah. bump rather than a, a drop yeah. because you weren't expected to get yeah. more than seven. So that that suggests they have the data to be able to right. create the handicap, the okay. effective golf handicap, and say, okay, you should have a three shot head start because we'd expect you to lose eleven eight. Can we not introduce that on Monday night at the club? <laughs> just, just for you, so just for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So yeah. because it, there is a feeling though at the moment, I feel like you play and then you lose and then you know, your duper ratings come down a little bit because you've lost. But yeah. even though you've played someone a higher rating, but it is what it is, I suppose. Um, I don't know if much more to go on. I mean, we've been talking for an hour. Have I we? think it's really no, good not. and I've yeah. really enjoyed it. Uh, that's been a nice, easy conversation. Andy, well, that's what I wanted it to be, sort of <laughs> organic. I don't know. Yeah. Just finally, I don't know, where do you, or where do you see yourself with pickleball in five years? Where would you like the sport to be in five years? If you had, a, if, if you can have, if you, Oh yeah, by the way, Martin is running for the national director. We do need to support him. So these people who are voting, the voting, this will go out before the voting ends. We yeah, are- 20, 23rd of March. 23rd of March. Is 23rd when March, ends, of March. Yeah. So this, 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 this podcast will come out before then. Um, please vote for Martin. He's a good guy. He will do a great job. He's done a great job with our club. Um, what do you want, what would you like if you had a legacy? What would you like to, um, to leave behind if, in, just for pickleball? Well, I think it's a bit- Bit too early in my life to start talking about legacies, Andy. But <laughs> um, I'm not suggesting you're going anywhere. But <laughs> in a, from a personal level, yeah. you know, just for me individually, yeah. five years time, ten years, twenty years time, I want to still be playing the sport, which yeah. I'm sure I will be. You know, yeah. so there is this addiction thing going on, and I don't see myself. Well, I'm, I'm with you on that because I want to be, uh, I want to be champion at, when I'm 100 yeah. at, at my at my level or whatever it's 3.5. Yeah. Actually, sorry, <laughs> slight slight tangent. We uh, we played in this tournament in Cambridge, um, and we were on court. There was uh, some people playing on court, and there was an age difference between two people on the court of about 62 years. Oh wow! Which was fantastic. You know? They played and together. No, they're playing against each other. They're, they're, they're in some they're playing against each other and there was a age you know difference what, of... <laughs> what uh, the older yeah, well, person was? No, I'm not allowed to say that. So you, you have to be modest in these sort of things and it's probably appropriate to say. Okay. But a 62-year age difference and they could compete on the same court. Now, isn't that fantastic? That's wonderful. Yeah? There's that, not many sports where you can do that. No, no really I totally isn't. agree. Yeah, no, yeah. That's what's great yeah, about it. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I want to still be playing the sport when I'm, you know, in my advanced, in my advanced, in more advanced years. More advanced years, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of legacy, you know, if I... Whether I get onto the um, Pickleball England board or not, kind of, as, let's say it's irrelevant from a legacy of the sport, I'd like to, clearly I'd like PB to be the, the national governing body. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like it to be the one that's accredited or um, by Sport England. But to be honest, if it isn't, I would still like all the membership to turn around and say, actually, that's the one we want to be our governing body, and that's we'll vote with our feet and we will support Pickleball, Pickleball England. Because um, they're doing a great job. They're doing a fantastic job. You know, see what Karen and the team have done to grow the sport to where it is now. I'd like to see that continue. Naturally, we want to get the club, the membership up to 25,000 by 2025. Is that the target? Is That's that the target. And that's the and where, and where are we? Do you think, where are um, we officially? Officially, think? officially, the last figure I saw, which was a couple of weeks ago, was 7,000. We'd grown. Regis, re, that's registered, registered members with a P, that's registered PBE. registered members with PBE. Right. So beginning of the year, it was 6,000. Within a month, they'd added another 1,000 members. Wow. Um, and we really want to keep that momentum going. Now, these are people who are registered. Yeah, because the numbers, are, they yeah. reckon, is twelve to 14,000 that might be playing yeah. people in the UK. I think um, in the AGM a couple of weeks ago, the estimate was it's more like 15,000. So right. if, if there are 6,000 registered, there's probably another 9,000, another one and a half times who aren't registered. Um, so we want to get as many people as we can registered again, which validates, to my mind, you know, the, the job that PB are doing. So anyone watching, though, what, and they, oh. they're not members, what, what, why would you join... Pickleball England, apart from the fact that you just accredit, you're associated with a, a, a body. Well, I think in, there are a number of. First and foremost, you know, you we do need as a, as a sport to have a governing body who is doing right. the coordination to help grow the sport on grassroots. There needs to be some. There does need to be some sort of coordination. Without that coordination, you won't have at the top end. You know, the opens, the nationals, all those sort of uh, events taking place. It just won't happen. And again, under that umbrella, you end up with regional events. You end up with um, local events. There has to be somebody who's also organising the, not so much the rules, but there is a rules element, but also things like the coaching and getting standards right. Yes. You need a governing body to help set the standards. Yes. Yeah? And also implement the standards if you want to get a new club set up. So, yeah. you know, you have all the accreditation of uh, Pickleball leaders, all organised under the auspices of Pickleball England. That's stuff that they do, be, in a sense, behind the scenes that we will benefit from and they've been doing for years. So without um, a body like Pickleball England, that stuff just wouldn't happen. Or it would, or it would happen in Hampshire, but it might happen slightly differently in Surrey. So when Surrey and Hampshire teams come to play against each other, you'd have to have a discussion about which rules or which standards are we playing. That's Thankfully, true. we have a governing body, a de facto governing body that's already done that for us and has continued to do that. Okay, yeah. so, so by us as individuals becoming members of that uh, organisation, that enables them to go forth and carry on. Then there are there are other benefits. You can enter these competitions. You know, yes. If you're not a member, you can't enter some of these competitions, like the uh, the nationals. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Southeast Pickle League, I'll get the other regional leagues as well. Um, there are various doubles events that take place on Sundays. All those require you to be registered, and you get those. For clubs, you can get cheap insurance. Again, um, Pickle England have negotiated cheaper insurance with I think it's Mead, um, so you can again get that cover for your pub. Um, public liability public and all liability, that sort yeah. of stuff yeah um, so there's a number of benefits you get as it, both as a club and as an individual by buying by being because you, you touched on something I actually I, I don't, time's running by but coaching is you know I went on a, on the level one course and there seems to be quite a lot of people doing level ones sort of basic entry level but the, the level two is quite arduous and I know there are people well apparently yeah because you've got to be able to do yeah. repeated shots and yeah. stuff because yeah. I think Speaking to a gentleman called Rob, you know, Rob, Rob, like Rob who's, yeah, yeah. who's come yeah. and done a bit of coaching for us, because that's really important as well. It's finding coaches that can actually enhance. I know we all try and help yeah. within the club, but we're not coaches. We we run well, we run sessions. Well, we have we have some level one qualified coaches in the in the club, which is fantastic. Um, we have about four, I believe, it is within our club, and then we have other people like you know, like your good self, who will also do some coaching. I have done the level one, okay, there but we I go. haven't done the I haven't done the rule bit yet. I haven't okay. done the online okay. game, okay. but I mean so the, anyway, the, that transition to level two is quite it is a big step arduous. up. It's a big, big step, step up. But what I would encourage any player, but also any club, is to go to tap into outside coaches. Um, Rob Williams does a great job. You know, we've had Thaddy Lock. And I know you've Good got. Shout. I got yeah. Thaddea coming. We're having an interview yeah. with Thaddea shortly. Soon. She did some fantastic yeah, um, coaching uh, for us uh, about six weeks or so ago before she yeah. went out on sort of the Southeast Asia and Australian part of her yeah. uh, international tour. I think and she then, improved so many of the people that attended that yeah. just overnight. I think a lot of people just walked away because yeah. our messages as coaches in the within the club are slightly different. Yeah. We we all picking up our own experiences, but she, as a professional player as yeah. well, she was giving us some great. 
really fantastic. Traits, getting moving yeah. us away from yeah. the skills of like you don't stop being a tennis player or stop being a badminton player yeah, or stop yeah, being yeah. You know, all those bad habits all yeah, those bad yeah. habits yeah but i said bringing those external sort of um external individuals in to look at your collective game your individual game is you know it's worth the money. Yeah, it, it costs money. Of course, it's, they have to earn a living, but it really is worth it. And we'll have Thaddea back. We'll have Rob back. We're talking about getting uh, Molly Kubrick to come and do some coaching for us as well. Who's Molly? Uh, Molly's uh, the lady who's setting up Femme Pickable. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've been in contact with Molly. Sorry, yeah. Molly. You will be coming down to have a chat. <laughs> That's yeah. not a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She can set the record straight there. Yeah, no. yeah. So, oh. like I know. So, get, get external people in. Yeah, she's, she's a really Villa fan, by the way. Oh, well, yeah. maybe yeah. not then. Maybe. <laughs> I'll get her to sit in the blue chair. Yeah. <laughs> get the blue side That's of Birmingham, it. isn't it? Yeah. Right, Martin, okay. look, I've got to thank you for coming along. Really, it's been a pleasure. I've really fun. enjoyed it. Thank you yeah. ever so much. Cheers, mate.